Today's text comes from Judges chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh after Ehud died. So Yahweh sold them into the hand of the king Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoim. Then the Israelites cried out to Yahweh for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophet, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take possession at, position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulon. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for Yahweh will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh with 10,000 warriors, went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're often impacted by a lack of vision because we're simply not paying attention correctly or because everything is so customary to us that we tune out things that are obvious right in front of us. We wander around the house looking for the glasses that sit upon our nose or on top of our head. We search for the keys to the car while holding them in our hands. We talk with somebody on the phone and looking around to find the phone we're holding to be able to text them or locate some information. Don't laugh at me. You've all done this. We've all done it. We focus so much on going through the motions of life that we simply miss the obvious time and time again until something comes along and shakes our awareness of the things that are right before our eyes. When God does that, how do we respond? Ancient Israel, we believe to be very averse to women in positions of leadership and authority. And yet, today's text seems to fly in the face of that wholly and completely. Deborah is introduced to us as a prophet, the same term used for Moses and for Elijah and Elisha, simply with the addition of a feminine ending to the term, notating that she was indeed a woman. We're confronted with Deborah as prophet, and then it is explained to us that she was governing Israel. She was in a position of authority standing outside the priestly tradition. And yet Israel was coming to her to find guidance, to hear the voice of Yahweh, to settle disputes with one another and to find that there was someone who could speak with authority from the perspective of Yahweh, allowing them to know better how to structure their lives 
and carry on in Yahweh's presence. Deborah set up court, so to speak, under a palm tree that was then given her a name, apparently at an oasis. Outside the supposed centers of power in Israel, beyond the standards of the priesthood or away from the tabernacle, and yet she represented Yahweh. She spoke with Yahweh's voice, the mouthpiece of the Almighty, conveying messages about God's will, God's purpose, God's direction for how to live and relate to one another as the people set apart from the other nations of the world. Israel was suffering because of attacks from enemies of other lands. And they cried out to Yahweh for help, and they came tracking down Deborah, knowing that she would be a vehicle through whom they would hear the word of Yahweh and could request Yahweh's intervention. Redemption, redemptive action from God. So they come seeking out Deborah for deliverance. And she calls out Barak from the tribe of Naphtali. We're not told much about him. We know very little about who he was. Apparently, he was known to Deborah or Yahweh gave her his name, but he was seemingly already a leader of some kind among the people. She called him to her presence, and with that summons, he came. And she laid upon him a charge that had come from Yahweh, saying, Barak, you will lead my people. You will call out 10,000 from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun, and you will go confront the enemies, and Yahweh will deliver them into your hand. There's so many things here that should stop us in our tracks. We just assume that ancient Israel had problems with women in positions of authority, with women in positions of prominence and leadership. We assume that women would never be accepted as vessels by whom God would speak. And yet if we turn back a few generations, we find Miriam, listed as a prophet alongside her brother, Moses. We find Hannah in the book of Samuel standing out as a higher order of one who is faithful to Yahweh than Eli, the high priest himself. We will find Abigail listed for us as an example of a leader who far outstrips her husband in character and in being attuned with the will and purposes of Yahweh. We will find other women like Samson's mother in the book of Judges who stands out head and shoulders above her husband. And yet these women are simply not ascribed the prominence that we find given to the men of their day. But the book of Judges makes no bones about the fact that they were indeed leaders and held authority and sway and influence alongside and at times surpassing the leadership gifts and efforts of the men in the community of Israel. 
perhaps it's not so much that women in ancient Israel could not be leaders. It's rather that the examples of women in leadership are simply not recorded and passed down front and center in a way that we take note when they are presented. Deborah was a leader that Israel turned out to seek. They sought after her advice, her direction, her speaking for Yahweh. She didn't need to seek prominence. It was cast upon her as Israel turned to her, recognizing Yahweh's voice loudly and prominently in her words and in the actions of her life. Barak seemingly had no issues with hearing this summons by Deborah with accepting her authority, with accepting that she indeed spoke for Yahweh. I've heard all sorts of rationales and and excuses and arguments against women in the military. I've heard the argument that they are a distraction to the men who would be fighting. I've heard arguments that they would, their presence would lessen morale. I've heard that they would get in the way of the men doing the fighting, that they would be a burden upon others around them that would, should be depending upon their help and assistance. There's none of that that we find in this text. Barak accepts Deborah's authority, her leadership. The 10,000 men from Naphtali and Zebulun turn out upon her summons. And the only issue raised is, I will go if you go with me. I've never heard that argument from the military men who would be unwilling to go out to battle unless the woman issuing the call to arms would head out to the battlefield and stand by their side. It shouldn't be surprising. Because those words from the lips of Barak are not surprising when we hear them on the words of other military leaders in Israel who make the same claims toward some other male prophet. Who make the same claim toward Yahweh. If you will go with me, then I will follow this summons. Deborah was no distraction. She was a visible representation of Yahweh's presence. That this summon came from Yahweh and from no other place at all. She would be a visible reminder to the men who had come out to her call, to her summons a reminder that Yahweh was present with them and would be orchestrating a victory on their behalf. Her presence would offer confidence in battle. In ancient Israel, most of those who died on the battlefield were not killed facing down their enemies. They died turning tail and running away. Having the confidence to face down one's enemies 
was the hallmark of victory in battle. If one could stand firm, if one could hold the line, if one could face danger despite one's fears and anxieties, the battle was already won. Barak calls on Deborah and says, If you will go with me, if you will be the visible representation of Yahweh's hand and presence with us, then I will go and I will trust Yahweh's victory. The text that we read today is about so much more than the proper role of women in the church or in society or even in a military situation. It's not about who is worthy of hearing God's word and being a conduit of God's presence and word and message. It's much more about being willing to embrace the call of God upon our lives. About having the confidence to accept that God is indeed with us. Despite the turmoil and uncertainty and traumas we may face. Will we see God present in our midst? Like the glasses we've been so desperately searching for, the car keys we can't seem to find, or the cell phone we carry in our hand. Yahweh has promised to be with us has promised to speak to us and through us, to engage the world around us if we would but trust. Deborah can govern in Israel because she gave her life to trusting the presence and action of God within her, moving and speaking and guiding. The notion of people being unworthy or unfit to serve God is completely washed away in texts like this. No, it is not that God dismisses people from being worthy vessels. It is we, human beings, who put up obstacles for allowing God to govern our lives and through us influence and transform the world around us. If we could only see past our prejudices, past the blinders we put on ourselves, we might see God acting in many surprising ways through people that we would more easily shove aside as worthless, but through whom God is graciously willing and desirous to speak. Will we hear? Will we see? Will we pay attention Will we answer the summons of God when he calls us out into fields ripe for harvest, awaiting justice, mercy, 
compassion, love. The touch of God's transforming and healing presence. 